Hello everyone, and welcome to Nuclear Reactor Kinetics and Dynamics Lectures. Today we're going to discuss the Prompt Jump Approximation and the Prompt Kinetics Approximation, which are two of the most common approximations in the field of kinetics. These approximations are useful because they make the point kinetics equations even easier to solve, and also because they provide some valuable insight on the physics behind kinetics phenomena. But before we discuss these approximations, let's talk some dollars and cents. Dollars and cents are the common units for reactivity during kinetics transients. These units owe their unique names to the secrecy of the Manhattan Project. It's inevitable that if you get enough nuclear engineers together in a social environment, they will eventually start talking about work. This is true today, and it was true then during the Manhattan era. Realizing that discussing weapons-related topics in public could potentially reveal top-secret information, the Los Alamos physicists developed a coded language to discuss these topics. These secret units include the barn, unit for microscopic cross-sections, shakes, a unit for time, and dollars and cents. A $1 reactivity insertion corresponds to a reactivity that is equal to the system's delayed neutron fraction. A half dollar reactivity insertion is one half of beta. Because there are a hundred cents in a dollar, a half dollar reactivity insertion is also equivalent to a 50 cent insertion. It's important to note that a reactivity insertion that exceeds one dollar causes the reactor to become prompt supercritical, which means that the system no longer requires delayed neutrons to maintain criticality and that its power will increase rapidly. Generally, power reactors are designed to operate either in the subcritical range or in the delayed critical range or the delayed supercritical. Power reactors are almost never exactly critical. They're always oscillating between being slightly subcritical and slightly supercritical, but never prompt supercritical. Any supercritical transients that happen in the reactor must contain less than one dollar of reactivity worth so that the transient does not become prompt supercritical. If it does become prompt supercritical, this transient is likely to cause some significant mechanical stress in the fuel or some thermal shock just due to how quickly power is generated in the reactor. Some reactors, such as trigopulse reactors, are actually designed to be operated under prompt supercritical conditions. They can routinely take four or five dollar reactivity insertions because their fuel is specifically designed to expand throughout these rapid transients so that these mechanical stresses do not crack or damage the fuel. In this course, we will review each one of these kinds of transients, subcritical, supercritical, and prompt supercritical. Last time when we discussed the in-hour equations, we mentioned that a reactor's power tends to increase or decrease exponentially during kinetics transients, except at the very start of the transient. During the short initial building in time, we see that the reactor's power jumps up very quickly before eventually assuming its asymptotic exponential behavior. This quick jump is known as the prompt jump, and it happens because of the rapid increased multiplication of prompt neutrons following a reactivity insertion. Even if a transient is not prompt supercritical, any positive reactivity insertion will multiply the number of prompt fission neutrons in the system. Now we've mentioned how delayed neutrons really control the reactor's long-term behavior, at least for non-prompt supercritical transients, and that the relatively long time that it takes for new fission products to release delayed neutrons causes reactors to respond rather slowly to kinetics transients. This is exactly what we see here. The long-term behavior of the reactor is constrained by the slowly emitting delayed neutron precursors, but when the transient initially starts, we see an almost immediate increase in the power due to increased multiplication of prompt neutrons, which are now encountering this positive reactivity insertion. This causes that prompt jump that we see. The amount of time it takes for this prompt jump to occur is known as tau sub p, and it is about equal to the prompt neutron generation time divided by beta minus rho. Prompt neutrons cause fissions very, very quickly, so the time it takes for this prompt jump to happen is generally quite short, around 10 to the negative fourth seconds for fast reactors, and about 10 to the negative 3 seconds for thermal reactors. The prompt jump approximation assumes that this prompt jump takes place instantly, and that we can assume that the reactor settles on its asymptotic exponential power shape immediately. For the power to assume this asymptotic shape, we must have a different initial power at time t equals 0. This new adjusted initial power is equal to the y-axis intercept of the asymptotic curve, and we denote it using the adjusted p-naught term, where the not symbol has been raised to become a superscript. 
we will soon solve for this adjusted initial power. For the prompt jump to take place immediately, it means that tau sub p must approach zero. The only way that this can happen is if we assume that the neutron generation time also approaches zero. The prompt jump approximation makes this assumption and it takes the limit at which lambda approaches zero of lambda times the point kinetics neutron balance equation. Our lambdas cancel out on the power and squiggle terms, but not on the derivative of the power term, which thus becomes zero. This does not mean that we assume that the power derivative is equal to zero, but rather that it is removed completely from this balance equation. It's just not in there. We will now solve for the adjusted initial power, which will serve as the new initial condition for our power when we solve our point kinetics equations. From here, we can apply the constant delayed source approximation to assume that our one group lambda squiggle is equal to beta times p naught, where this is the p naught from before when this transient began and not the adjusted p naught. With this, we can solve for the prompt jump approximation's adjusted initial power, which is equal to the pre-transient power times beta divided by beta minus rho. This term makes sense when we think about it for a second. Increasing the value of rho will decrease the value of the denominator and thus increase our adjusted initial power. This happens because increasing rho moves our transient closer and closer towards the prompt supercritical regime where rho is equal to one. Being closer to the prompt supercritical regime means that we have increased prompt neutron multiplication, which thus increases our adjusted initial power. With this new initial power condition in hand, we can continue solving the point kinetics equations. We take our post prompt jump approximation neutron balance point kinetics equation and take the time derivative of both sides. Notice that we treat our reactivity as a function of time here. One benefit of the prompt jump approximation is that it allows us to solve for reactor behavior during non-constant reactivity insertion transients. After taking the time derivative of this expression, we can solve for the d squiggle dt term, which is also equal to the left-hand side of the precursor balance point kinetics equation. We substitute in the value of lambda squiggle from our prompt jump approximation equation, and we find that dp dt is equal to the reactor's power times lambda rho plus rho dot, all divided by beta minus rho. This equation should look a little familiar. If we take a look at equation 6109, which was the solution to the in-hour equation for a constant reactivity insertion, which is also known as a step insertion, we see that one of the exponential terms in this equation contains this lambda rho divided by beta minus rho term. Note that because the step insertion contains a constant reactivity, rho dot is equal to zero here. So if we were to solve our prompt jump approximation equation, we would get an exponential function that has the same exponential coefficient as our in-hour equation solution from last time. Note also that the coefficient here on the front of this exponential term in the in-hour equation solution is equal to the adjusted initial power according to the prompt jump approximation. So we see that the prompt jump approximation, through entirely different means and entirely different assumptions, arrives at the same solution for the power during a transient as in the left-hand side of our in-hour equation solution. So what's up with this rightmost term in the in-hour equation solution? Well, if you remember from our last lecture, this term describes the effect of prompt neutrons, again where rho minus beta divided by lambda is equal to alpha prompt. This leftmost term describes the impact of delayed neutrons, and the right-hand term describes the impact of prompt neutrons. For transients that are either subcritical or not prompt supercritical, so rho is less than beta, the exponent in the prompt term is negative, which means that the prompt term here in the in-hour equation solution decays away rapidly, leaving only the delayed term to describe the reactor's asymptotic behavior. It turns out that we've already seen the impact of this quickly decaying prompt term already. It's responsible for that rapid prompt jump that we see at the start of a transient. So our in-hour equation does a really good job of describing our reactor's behavior during a supercritical but not prompt supercritical transient. We have one term that describes the prompt jump term here, which decays away quickly, and one term that represents the eventual asymptotic behavior due to delayed neutrons. 
It's also worth noting that our prompt jump approximations, differential equation for the power, tells us significant about the reactor's behavior. It contains one term that represents the prevailing behavior from delayed neutrons, or S sub d, the source of delayed neutrons, and one term, which is the reactivity derivative term, that represents the immediate multiplication of prompt neutrons after a reactivity insertion. This is the S sub p for prompt term. One interesting consequence of this equation deals with the steady state condition of power reactors. For a reactor to stay at steady state power, this dp function must be equal to zero. Now we know that the S sub d term, the delayed neutron source term, is not equal to zero for a steady state reactor. So this means that the S sub p term must remain negative for the reactor to stay at steady state. This is exactly what happens. Reactors that are exactly critical are really actually subcritical reactors. The reactor doesn't have enough prompt neutrons to remain critical on them alone, so it's constantly trying to decrease its power, which makes the S sub p term negative. This negative S sub p term is offset by the delayed neutron source term, S sub d, which causes the reactor's power to remain constant. So all power reactors are actually really subcritical assemblies that have this extra delayed neutron source that keeps them critical. This equation leads to some interesting questions, such as can a reactor's power decrease during a supercritical transient, and can it increase during a subcritical transient? The answer to both of these questions is yes. It's easy to see why mathematically the power can decrease during a supercritical transient if the derivative of the reactivity is negative and exceeds lambda rho. For example, if an 80 cent reactivity insertion is rapidly decreased to a 20 cent insertion, the system is still supercritical, and its power will continue to increase over the long term, but that instantaneous drop in the reactivity decreases the multiplication of prompt neutrons, which thus causes our system's power to drop. This is sometimes counterintuitive, but a very interesting characteristic of reactivity transients. The magnitude of the reactivity insertion isn't the only thing that matters. The rate of the insertion matters too. Now let's review a quick sample application of the prompt jump approximation. Let's say that our reactor experiences a ramp reactivity insertion, where rho is equal some constant a times time. We can substitute a t and its derivative, which is just a, into our differential power equation from the prompt jump approximation, which, after a bit of math, gives us that the power is equal to the adjusted initial power times e to the integral of lambda a t plus a, all divided by beta minus a t. Note here that our adjusted power is still equal to beta divided by beta minus rho, but rho is no longer a constant, it's a t. Lastly, we will discuss the prompt kinetics approximation, which is in many ways the exact opposite of the prompt jump approximation. The prompt kinetics approximation is in some ways unique compared to the rest of the material that we've discussed so far in this course. Previously, we've only discussed delayed supercritical and subcritical transients, but the prompt kinetics approximation applies to prompt supercritical transients. During a prompt supercritical transient, our reactor behaves similarly to our previous non-prompt supercritical transient. There is an initial jump in the power, but then the power quickly assumes an asymptotic shape, which is a very rapidly increasing asymptotic shape here for this prompt supercritical transient. If we look at our in our equation, we see that our prompt term is now positive and that it has a positive exponent, while our delayed term is now negative and has a negative exponent. So now our delayed term is responsible for that non-asymptotic behavior at the very, very beginning of our prompt supercritical transient. Because our system is prompt supercritical, its asymptotic power relies only on prompt neutron multiplication, but at the very, very start of our transient, our delayed neutron source is still releasing a non-negligible amount of delayed neutrons, which then get multiplied by our enormous prompt supercritical reactivity and causes a quick jump in the power. Eventually our delayed neutron source just can't keep up with the prompt neutrons, and the delayed neutron contribution becomes negligible as the power increases by many orders of magnitude. But at the very, very start of the transient, the delayed neutrons give the reactor's power a quick boost. So under the prompt kinetics approximation, we can ignore all delayed neutrons in our point kinetics equations, which means that our alpha is simply equal to rho minus beta 
divided by capital lambda, which is equal to alpha prompt. From here, our power is dictated by this simple differential equation where we can define the amount of prompt reactivity, or rho sub p, in the system, which is just equal to rho minus beta. Essentially, this prompt reactivity is how prompt supercritical our system is. We can solve this differential equation for non-constant reactivity insertions, such as our ramp insertion, but it quickly becomes increasingly complex. So we'll mostly apply the prompt kinetics approximation to a simple constant step reactivity insertion. Given this constant reactivity insertion, our system's power is given by the prompt terms in the solution to the in-hour equation. Our new adjusted p0 is equal to rho divided by rho minus beta, and p of t is equal to rho divided by rho minus beta times e to the alpha prompt t. This concludes our discussion of the approximations to the point kinetics equations. We are actually almost done discussing the kinetics half of this course. In the next and final kinetics lecture, we will begin introducing temperature feedback during a kinetics transient, and thus beginning our journey into the realm of reactor dynamics.